All right, hey people on YouTube land, Zach Hall back here, and today I want to do my one month review, a little bit more now, but one month review of the Reformation Heritage Study Bible, or King James Study Bible, sorry. Um, and so yeah, sorry guys, I've been away for a little bit, but I hope to be producing more content here. But I'm going to get right into this review as far as the material of it. So if you wanted to see an overall review of this or a quick overview, I recommend going to my playlist and just scrolling through. It would be one of the first videos that pop up there. Um, and you can see a general overview where it talks about the outside and all the features of the Bible just quickly. Today we're going to do a little bit more in-depth. This may have to be a two-part review. Um, I don't know yet. It just depends how long my camera goes here. But we'll see. So let's just jump right into this. So... In the front here, of course, you get uh, your family record page, uh, family record pages, and all that stuff. Um, a presentation page and the occasions to remember. But then after that, you're pretty much jumping straight into the Bible text here. Now, one of the cool things that I didn't know when I first got this, but after reading through it, let's see if you can see here. It says here that the concordance and tables of weights and measures, together with the digitized text of the authorized King James version of the Holy Scriptures are used by the kind permission of the Trinitarian Bible Society. And so I knew I loved the font in this Bible. I just didn't know why until I read that note, and then I realized, oh, TBS allowed them to use a font. I think this is the same font that's in the Windsor and in the Westminster. And so I thought that was a pretty cool little feature. And they're both actually located very close to each other. So uh, Reformation Heritage Publishers are actually, or Reformation Heritage Books uh, are in Grand Rapids, Michigan, so they're not too far from TBS. Then you get a table of contents here, which we're going to look through all of that. So we'll just flip through that page really quick. Now, a note on the paper, this stuff is very thin. And I mean very thin. But we'll see later when I took notes. It, it holds up well. Um, another thing is, when I first got it, I had a lot of page curling. Now that it's had time to really kind of uh, acclimate to my region where, where, where I live, I really don't have too much page curling anymore. So if that's something that worries you, I would say, you know, get one and it's going to take a little bit, but it will, it'll uh, start laying flat and not have any page curl. But here we're going to have a list of in-text articles. So if you want to pause that and take a look at that, feel free to do that. We'll look at some of these articles. I'm not going to go through every single one of them because that would make this review a little too long, but we'll definitely look at a couple probably. Then over here, you have an alphabetical list of the books of the Bible. Then you get abbreviations of the books of the Bible. Then you get into a welcome of the Reformation Heritage Study Bible, King, or King James Study Bible. And so this is kind of just an introduction to the book, uh, why it's been produced. Um, so we can read the first paragraph, and there's a couple things that I do want to read in this. But So it says, God has spoken, and his written word is the Bible. In an age of uncertainty, this is good news. His word is light in our darkness. You can know God and hear his voice today by reading the pages of his book. Here is pure truth, truth you can trust. The Lord Jesus Christ, the living word, still speaks in the written word by his spirit. His words are life, and the Holy Spirit can make them life for you too. And we're going to jump down here a little bit into where it breaks it up. So it pretty much explains the whole title. So we're going to look at Reformation, Heritage, King James, and then Study Bible. So down here you have the Reformation Heritage are more than the name of the publisher. These words remind us that the Lord granted a theological and spiritual revival in the 16th and 17th centuries that resulted in a rich legacy of Bible truth for the church. Located in this Bible at key places throughout the text of Scripture are short articles about key teachings of the Christian faith, some drawn from the writings of the Reformers and Puritans, and others by modern theologians who stand in the same stream of thought. At the end, you will also find an overview of church history and a collection of classic creeds and confessions, declarations from the church of its living faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it goes through a little bit of the Reformation. Then you get the King James, which I like this right here, what it says about the King James. It says, The King James Version is the classic translation that God has used to nourish English-speaking Christians for more than 400 years. The work of godly and highly educated Bible scholars, the KJV or Authorized Version, remains useful, reliable, and widely read. The care of the translators is reflected in their placing of italics for any words not found in the original that were added for the reader's understanding. Though sometimes viewed as quaint, the use of thee and thou actually reveals that the original text designated the singular as opposed to the plural ye or you, a clarity of expression no longer in use in modern English. 
It is true that the meanings of some words have changed over the centuries, but to help modern readers, the study notes of this Bible define difficult words and phrases so that the whole is quite understandable. So I like that. They use the King James. They don't shy away from its language. They have definitions throughout as you're reading to help you understand. But they even explain the importance of the thee and thou. I was just at a Bible study where people were using modern translations, and we ran into this problem of uh, the you and you distinction. Who is it talking about? Is it singular or plural? And in the King James, it was pretty clear it was a singular. So uh, it does help. And then that was written by Joel Beakey, who is the general editor of the Study Bible. Joel Beakey does a lot of uh, family devotions, family worship writing. He also has helped write a systematic theology. Um, so he's a very studied man, uh, very pious and full of piety. And, he concern, and he's very concerned about family worship. And so you, we'll even see that as we go throughout this Bible, that there's a lot of emphasis on family worship and family time together in the Word. And so I uh, uh, would encourage you, though, to check out some of his sermons, too. He's preached a lot. He's done a lot of talks and conferences. Um, I have benefited from a lot of that. And then I believe he wrote this one here, too, reading the Bible experientially. So not just reading it academically or for head knowledge, but actually experiencing Christ and God in the Scriptures through the Holy Spirit. And so this is a great article as well. And I have read through that. It's a very good, very, very good article. It actually gives you here 10 ways to read the Bible experientially. So that's probably a great way to start before you actually get into this Bible. Then they uh, give a brief defense of why they chose the King James Version. And in this article, it goes over its tradition, text, and translation. I'm sorry that the camera's skipping out in there. Um, but it goes through, so pretty much just breaks down all three of those categories. So it's tradition, talks about how it stands in the line of long English traditions. It's text here at the bottom. It's going to talk about how um, it is based on the received text of the Reformation, which they're going to favor, especially since this, they made this in close collaboration with the Trinitarian Bible Society. They do take a very pro-AB stance and a, a very pro-Texas Receptus stance. So it's going to talk about how the Roman Catholic Church had kept the word pretty much bound by the Latin Vulgate, and then Erasmus translates the Greek uh, Textus Receptus, and this allows us then to translate the Bible into our modern vernaculars, and so we actually have the Word of God in our language. And it talks about its translation. So then it talks about how accurate the translation was, the translation process that the committees took, and so it is heaping praise. There's actually no criticism of the King James in this. It is all pro King James, um, and even over the some of the critical texts as well. And then in the conclusion, I wanted to read this. It says, uh, and I believe this was written by Joel Beakey as well, but maybe not. It says the publication of the King James Version, sixteen eleven, was a landmark. The version has left its mark for four hundred years on literature, uh, on literature, speech, culture, religion, and most significantly, the hearts of millions. It has earned its place as the most influential book ever printed, and with the passing of its 400th year anniversary, venerating it is appropriate. It is old, but it is not outdated. I liked how that was pit. It's old, but it's not outdated. It's very much for use for today. Then you get a, a Old Testament title page here. Then you're going to have an introduction to the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Hebrew canon. So it's going to cover Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Then you're actually going to get a introduction into Genesis. And so the way that this is kind of lined out is you're going to have an authorship and date on every one theme, the purpose of it, and then issues of interpretation. So they're going to go over what are big uh, interpretive issues that a lot of people have disagreed about. And they're going to lay out the different options. They typically favor one or two or, you know, something like that. They do actually pick one, but they let you know kind of what are the different opinions. And you can see this introduction in Genesis goes for a couple pages. So there's a lot of information there. And at the end, you get an outline of the book. These are typically small and condensed and very helpful. Now we get into the actual text of the Bible. You can see it's a nice, I believe this is a 10-point font text from the Trinitarian Bible Society. So it is digital. It's very clear, very crisp. The line spacing is very well done, and it is easy to read. But now we're getting into the study notes here. So you can see how it's kind of broken down. They give you the outline. So pretty much they will follow the outline that they give you at the beginning of the book throughout the notes. And then the notes are just labeled at the bottom. Now, there are no keys in the text to tell you uh, if there is a footnote. So you actually have to look at the bottom to see if there, there is a note. So just to give you a flavor of this, um, you know, if you're reading Genesis 1 here and you don't know what firmament means, you can come here. It has a note. It says firmament. 
So it actually gives you the word in scripture in italics, like the phrase or the word it's talking about, and then a definition after. So it says the word means expanse and includes outer space. It's not just the sky, since God calls the fir firmament heaven, and the stars are also pit in the firmament. Verse 14. This is expanse, which God stretches out. So you get all these references there. And so there's a bunch of good notes there. And then as we flip through here, we'll see a couple things. You get your first in-text article, which is Creation and God's Glory. And this is actually adapted from John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion. And I'm going to let you, for the sake of time, if you want to pause and read those bottom two paragraphs, I think those are some of the best words in this article. Um, so you can pause and read those. The the creation of God, uh, God and His glory uh, for the unbeliever, how he knows about God, even though he suppresses it, and then for the believer, what it means. So actually, I'll probably just read this section here about the believer. So it says, For the believer, the beauty of creation speaks of the majestic beauty of his God. With Scripture's revelation and the Spirit's work, the believer is able rightly to understand and appreciate the glory of God displayed in creation. He hears God's awesome voice upon the waters, breaking the cedars, shaking the wilderness, and causing new birth. Thus the believer worships the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Examining creation brings him to praise and submit to his sovereign creator who sustains the mass of heaven and earth by his word. God's not alone shakes the heavens with thunderbolts, kindles the air with flashes, disturbs the earth with storms, and then silences them, and compels the seas to hang as though in midair, only to make it calm again. All of this incites reverential awe and adoration in the heart of every believer for the glorious God heralded by creation. So, good note on creation there. Then, as we talked about the family worship, Joel Beakey, uh, and I don't know if he had anybody help him on these in particular, but the end of every chapter in this in the Bible, the end of every chapter, are a couple of thoughts for family and uh, family worship, for personal and family worship. Sorry. So if you're a single person, obviously this would be for your personal devotions. You could go through these. If you're a, a husband of a family, you could use this for family worship. Or maybe if you're a single mom, you could use this as a family worship for your kids as well. But here we'll read a couple of the questions that they have you think on. So at the end of chapter 1, it says here for the first question, Consider the power of God in creation. If a computer were observing 10 million stars per second, it would still take 63 million years to count all of the stars. Such is the power of the Almighty. Remarkably, the stars are the work of His fingers, but salvation is the work of His right hand. In a wonderful way, God's work in making believers new creations in Christ Jesus demonstrates a power greater than commanding the world into existence. Let us be amazed at the wonder of creation. Let us be overwhelmed by the wonder of grace. And so then here's the question. How does saving grace display even greater glory than creation? And so that could be a talking point you have during family or personal devotions to think on. Then the question, second question, stand in awe of the power of God's word. I'll have to flip the page here real quick. So it says, God's word is the agency of creation. God said, let there be. Christ demonstrated this power in the miracles, both with people, such as ra uh, raising Lazarus from the dead, and with his in, uh, inanimate creation, such as calming the storm. God's word is still powerful today through the scriptures. It is by the word of his power, as well that he bears his created world along according to his purpose of providence. The fact that God created gives him the right to govern and to use his creation as he sees fit. Since creation, including man, belongs to God, all of creation, including man, is dependent on him and accountable to him. The theological implications of creation are far-reaching. So then here we're considering the power of God's word and how we are to submit to his word. Now we're going to flip here to, uh, I believe I've booked Mark out, Exodus. And really what I want to show you here is that how practical the notes are. So... Uh, they range from very theological and very deep to very practical and really just helping understand the text. So here is an exodus when they start building the tabernacle. And there's a lot of words that are used that we typically don't run into, right? So here you have um, like the Urim and the Thummim. So it says here, used to receive direction from God. And it gives you some examples there where the Urim and the Thummim are consulted. And then the high priest was a prophet. And then here you have another reference to 2832, Habergen, armored shirt, uh, Hebrew, uncertain, but it means uh, rent or possibly torn. So you have there a definition of that. And then you have pomegranates, okay, round edible fruit, 
two to five inches in size found in the land of Canaan. And then here, bells, the priest must walk with the sounds of holiness to avoid fending the Lord that he die not. And then here you have mitre. So that's a turban that the high priest would wear on his head. And then hallow, okay, means to set apart as holy. The golden head plate showed that the priest must bear the responsibility to be holy, clean and obedient in order that the sacrifices may be accepted before the Lord. And then you have girdles, belts or satches, bonnets equals caps, uh, anoint, consecrate breaches. So you can see here, even in like when you're reading through a book like Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, um, a lot of stuff for the temple and the tabernacle are going to be kind of explained for you in like language that we use today. So that way you can actually visually see it in your head. Because a lot of times when I read these words in the King James, I don't necessarily know what they mean right off the bat. And so here's the example of where they have the modern equivalents or an explanation of what those words, what they mean. So it's very, very helpful. So here we'll just give you an idea of what it looks like when you flip throughout the Bible. So you have your commentary on the bottom, separated by a line every time, and then your text above. And I think the font for the footnotes is about an 8-point font, so it's still very readable. But now I'll flip here uh, right after Malachi. So we have an article here of what happened between the Testaments. Okay, so you're going to get a little bit of what happened between Malachi and Matthew. Then you have a New Testament title page, and then an introduction to the Gospels and Acts. So you're going to have an introduction to every section of Scripture. So you can see that runs two pages. Then you have the outline of Matthew, or excuse me, the introduction and then the outline of Matthew. So you can see here Matthew has a longer outline. And then you have the text of Matthew. This is not self-pronouncing text, um, so if you're interested in that, I want to make sure you are aware of that. So now we'll go to John 3. We'll get a sample of this. So obviously being the Reformation Heritage Study Bible, this is going to come from a Reformed perspective with regards to salvation and God's working in salvation. So here we'll read some notes from John 3. Now I thought it was interesting on some of these notes. So John 3... Um, five. Yeah. So it says there, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. They do take Calvin's interpretation of three five. So I thought that was an interesting note here, because he does not believe it is baptism. And uh, I would say I would, but I would. I obviously don't hold to the fact that baptism is regenerative. So I believe that uh, it's talking about baptism, but I believe that that is the symbol of the Spirit giving us the new birth. So. I mean, I would say it's more than a symbol, but not regenerative. But anyway, so here it says, Born of water, not baptism, but an allusion to Old Testament imagery of the renewing power of the Spirit. So there you have Isaiah 44, 3 through 5, Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27, and then given through the mediator, Jesus Christ. And so then you have the phrase, cannot enter into the kingdom. It is impossible for people to be converted and saved unless God works a miracle in their souls. So here they're going to take the position that you have to be regenerated first by God in order to believe in Jesus. So that is a Reformed view, whereas more of an Arminian or Provisionist view would be you believe and then you are regenerated. So they're going to take the opposite view of that. And then 3.6, we'll kind of see this as it continues. Born of the flesh is flesh, that phrase. Fallen human nature and its sin and misery can only produce more of the same. Salvation requires a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit who produces his image in sinners by the new birth. And then a note on 3.8. So Jesus says there in verse chapter 3, verse 8, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. So we have a note here. Wind, the same Greek word as spirit. So I think that's pneuma, if I'm not mistaken. And then perhaps alluding to Ezekiel's vision of the dry bones. Ezekiel 37.9.14. Uh, like the wind, the Holy Spirit is powerful, invisible, and beyond the scope of man's control or manipulation through ritual or method. He works as he chooses, or that word in the King James is listeth. Um, and then we get 3, 14, 15. I thought that was a good note, too. Lifted up the serpent. Okay, so it talks about, uh, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have 
eternal life. So it says, Lift up the serpent. After Israel's sins had brought deadly snake bites, God instructed Moses to affix a bronze image of a snake to a pole to heal anyone looking at it. This was a type or representation revealing God's decree that it was necessary for the heavenly king, the Son of Man, or Jesus, to be lifted up on the cross, so that all who look upon him with the spiritual side of faith will receive eternal life with God. And in 3.16, just to give you a flavor of like the fact that this is reformed, um, we'll see this a little bit in this note. So, for a further explanation of verses 14 to 15, okay, God... So we have there, the ultimate explanation for anyone's salvation is the will of the Father. So they're going to point to uh, excuse me, yeah, John 6, 38 through 40, Galatians 1, 4 and 5, Ephesians 2, 4. So loved, the Son did not win the Father's love for sinners, but came because God loved sinners. Indeed, loved them so much that he gave the most precious and costly gift imaginable, his only begotten Son. And then world. So they define this as a general term for humanity, viewed not as all persons, without exception in all places and times, but as man in his, un, or in his unified rebellion against God, making God's sacrificial love for all mankind, uh, making God's sacrificial love for mankind all the more amazing. And then whosoever believeth, so that phrase, God's purpose in sending Christ was not to save all persons, but to give everlasting life to those whom he would bring to saving faith through the new birth. Salvation from eternal ruin requires faith in Christ. And then here we'll just finish up with 3.17 and 18. Not to condemn. So Christ's first coming was not, to, not in order to judge or punish, but to bring salvation. To reject Christ is to bring God's judgment upon oneself. He that believeth is not condemned. Sinners are legally justified by the divine judge through faith alone in Christ. So some good notes there. Kind of give you a flavor of where this is coming from. I think some theologically sound notes, and I think most uh, even evangelicals, we would probably agree with that. So, going through here, though, or let's hear us look at John 1 1 2, because they'll have notes on his divinity. They have an article here on Christ's incarnation. And again, you saw that list at the beginning, because they have some good notes here in John 1. Okay, so John 1 1 through 18. So this is the prologue of John's gospel. It contains a summary of vital truths about Christ. He is God. So right off the bat, boom, we're talking about Jesus is deity. The creator of the world and the source of all true knowledge of God, uh, of God mankind has ever had. He is the fountain of all saving grace who came to earth to reveal God's saving truth to fallen mankind. And so that's pretty much a summary of verses 1, uh, 1 through 18 is that Jesus Christ is God. He took on flesh. Verse 14 and verse 18, the purpose of this was to reveal uh, the Father who is in heaven and then to save those who believe on him. So we have um, some good stuff. And then here at 1, 3, all things by him. Christ is the creator of the entire universe, including men and angels. This clearly implies that he was not created for anything, uh, for anything was, was made, was created by Christ. Sorry. So that shows that Christ is not some lesser being or an exalted, uh, an exalted deity, but he is in fact God himself who created all things. So some good notes. Good notes. Really love this Bible. Some in-depth notes that are going to help you when you're studying. Here's another article on experiential knowledge. And then we'll go to Galatians. Here's a note on Christ's resurrection and ours. And here we get into Galatians. Oop, I think I passed it. There's an article in here about justification by faith alone. So obviously, if you're Protestant, this is like our whole thing, right? So justification by faith alone. So you have a whole article here. So I'll just read the first kind of paragraph. In Galatians 2.16, Paul cuts to the very heart of what it means to be a Christian. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by works of the law. Paul is citing the greatest of all promises of God. He promises to pardon the sins of all people who truly believe in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, freeing them from all guilt and to impute, uh, and to, impute to them the perfect righteousness of Christ as a covering for all the remaining infirmities and indwelling sin. As justified people, they are righteous in Christ before God and heirs of eternal life. And so they're going to lay out here 
some key passages. But they begin at the end of this, they address the issue with James. And also in James 2, they have a lot of notes there too as well. And I think they answer this problem pretty, pretty good. So the last paragraph here, it says, Some see a contradiction between Paul and James on justification by faith apart from works. The fact is that James is asking a question about faith, not about justification. James 2.14. So James asked there, what faith can save you? So then they're going to say, The faith that justifies is no dead faith, but is always accompanied by graces such as self-denial, repentance, and thankfulness to God. And it always produces fruit in the form of good works done in conformity to God's law and for his glory. Paul agrees with James that a faith without such graces and fruits is a dead faith that cannot justify the sinner. The works of Abraham and Rahab show that theirs was the living faith, active justifying faith of true Christians. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. So they kind of answer that. Obviously the big debate there between Protestants and Roman Catholics is you know, what justifies us. The Catholics would say a faith working by love, so that love is part of the justifying process, whereas Protestants would say that faith alone in Christ is what saves us because we're grabbing a hold of his righteousness and all of his works and his death and his resurrection, and that love is accompanied by this true saving faith which God gives us through the new birth, so that, of course, we're going to produce good fruits. So they're very much going to be arguing against the idea that you can have some mental assent or mental belief in Christ and no change of life. And obviously the scriptures are very clear about that. Um, Paul says that he preached repentance and faith in Christ unto the Greeks so that they were to turn from their sin, to flee from it, to live in a holiness. Not that that saved them, but they had their minds changed about who they were and who God was. And so in that case, it resulted in a change of their life and they rested in Christ and his finished work. And thus they were saved from sin because their faith was in Christ and what he had done. But then that resulted in a completely changed lifestyle. And that's what Christ has called us into. Ephesians 2.10 says he saved us unto good works, which were uh, prepared before the foundation of the world, that we should walk in them. So very sound saying that faith is what justifies us. It is what secures our salvation in Christ because faith unites us to Christ. It's what grabs a hold of Christ and his righteousness and the trusting in his blood for the shedding of our sin, his resurrection to save us from death and sin. So very sound in that regard. Then we'll turn here to 1 Timothy 3. And I'll just show you here uh, kind of the note taking. So you can see I kind of wrote around it. There's not a ton of notes in here, for a uh, ton of room in here for notes. So I kind of just cram them in here wherever I can. But I want to show you the bleed through. Of this paper so you can kind of see it a little bit it goes through but it has not bled through the page and that was with the O1 pigma micron so if you use pigma microns on this you should be pretty good so you see some writing up there at the top and take a look at that as well there you go and so as we can kind of continue through this, we'll get to the back matter now. You've kind of seen the general outline of how this goes, uh, kind of what theology is in it, how it's laid out, the notes, the practical, practical notes and everything. And then once we get to the back, here we're going to have 20 articles of how to live as a Christian. So these are practical, experiential um, notes so we're going to come from more of a puritan warm puritan type of understanding so here we have united with christ experiencing justification and adoption growing in sanctification assured and persevering reading the scriptures why and how we pray worship in the means of grace so talking about the word of god the gospel baptism the lord's supper fellowship with with uh, believers how we regard ourselves, love to God, the fear of God, living by the Ten Commandments, godly contentment, self-denial, humility, how we kill pride, coping with criticism, enduring affliction, spiritual desertion, so when it feels like God's presence has left you, Feeling or fleeing, excuse me, worldliness, fighting against backsliding, family worship, 
being a Christ-like husband, being a godly wife. So you can see some very practical um, articles back here. Showing hospitality, raising children in the Lord, being a Christian grandparent, honoring your parents, serving God at work, using leisure time well, so anytime you have off, what are you doing with it? Witnessing for Christ, defending our faith, facing sickness and death, living positively, not in the modern sense, <laughs> uh, living for God's glory. And so those are the articles. And then you have 20 centuries of church history, which this, these are adapted and were originally written by Sinclair Ferguson. So he does a lot of work with Ligonier Ministries. So I'll go through these real quick. So first century of apostolic foundations. Second century, you have the Church of Martyrs and Confessors. Third century, persecution and heresy, origin and Tertullian. The beginnings of the Christian Empire, the fourth century. Fifth century, the city of God and the city of man. It's going to be about Augustine, pretty much. The sixth century, uh, Justinian, Benedict, and the conversion of the Scots. The seventh century, Gregory the Great and the rise of Islam. The eighth century, the iconoclastic controversy. So, whether icons should be venerated and worshipped or not. The 9th century, struggle for power in the church, uh, Ratramus and Gottschalk. The 10th century, the Dark Ages. The 11th century, the Great Schism. Uh, I think that's between the East and West, so the Orthodox and the Roman Catholic Church. Anselm of Canterbury, he was an English bishop, I believe. The 12th century, the Crusades, Abelard, Lombard, and the Waldensians. The 13th century, Francis of Assisi. I, hope, I think that, that's how you say that. And then Thomas Aquinas. 14th century, the Church's Babylonian Captivity and John Wycliffe. The 15th century, the Renaissance, Huss, Sarah, uh, Sarah Rolla, and Groot. 16th century, Luther, Calvin, and the Reformation. 17th century, Reforming the Church in England. 18th century, The Great Awakening. The 19th century, Beginnings of Modern Theology and Kingdom Builders. And then the 20th century, The Age of Paradoxes. So, some good articles there to read through. Then you're going to have Creeds and Confessions. Here's the list of all the creeds and confessions in this Bible. So, this just shows the historic faith as it's been passed down. And what these people confessed at different times. So, the first one is the Apostles' Creed. And then you have the Nicene, the Athanasian Creed, the Belgic Confession. And uh, once you get into like the Belgic Confession and these other ones, uh, they get kind of long. So this is still the Belgic Confession. And I actually did read through uh, pretty much all of these. Then you have the Heidelberg Catechism. This is actually a teaching tool in the Reformed Churches of the, what is it? What century? 16th century? Yeah. Uh, a catechism, which is a teaching tool to teach the congregation and children. And so there was one question that was asked every Lord's Day and one answer given. And then you would answer and respond to learn a doctrine and the faith. So that goes through 52 weeks or 52 Lord's Days. Then you have the Canons of Dort. So these were the uh, questions that the Arminians brought up at the Council of Dort. Uh, and the remonstrants, as they were known, and then the traditional Calvinistic um, kind of party that was in control then. And so the candidates of Dort uh, answer the uh, remonstrance uh, objections to Calvinism. So they kind of refute their refutation. And that's done by negatives, which are a rejection, and then confessions, which are positive And so the Canons of Dort go for a good while. And then you have the Westminster Confession of Faith, which was 1647, pretty much the standard Presbyterian confession today in America and in uh, other parts of the kind of Reformed world. Um, I don't know that many continental Reformed churches use this, but it is big in America and in England. Typically, with the Continental Reformers and even the Dutch Reformed in America, you have uh, the form of three unit or the forms of three unity, which I think is the Belgic Confession, the Heidelberg, um, 
And then there's one more I can't quite remember. Oh, the Canons of Dort. Yeah, those three. But the Westminster is pretty much the Presbyterian one, so it's got a lot of chapters on different doctrines. And then you have a catechism for the Westminster. This is the shorter catechism. Its uh, most famous line is essentially the first question here. What is the chief end of man? Answer, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And then it gives scriptural text proof for, or proof text, excuse me, for every question and answer. So again, the shorter catechism is really to catechize your children or to teach them the faith. And then they also have, as we've entered now, the larger catechism. This would be more for ministers who are trained for Presbyterian ministry. Uh, this gives them more in-depth answers. Okay, and then we have a reading plan in the back. Essentially, this is the same that's in the Trinitarian Bible Societies, although they take this and break it up into family worship on the left and private reading on the right. So you have January 1st, family worship. You read Genesis 1 and Matthew 1, so you would discuss the questions there at the end of those chapters. Private reading, you have Ezra 1 and Acts 1, so you could reflect personally on the questions there. But again, this goes through, I think, two years. And No, actually, this is a one-year plan. Because you're doing it, yeah, you're doing two readings today. So it actually is a one-year plan for you. The money, weights, and measures, and concordance. This is all from the Trinitarian Bible Society. So if you've seen the Westminster or anything like that, that's pretty much all the information that's in there. And you have a pretty decent concordance here, again, from the Trinitarian Bible Society. So it's going to have a lot of entries for you. And then at the back, the maps, again, since... Oh, and actually, I should mention this, too, if you're looking at getting this Bible. There are a ton of blank Bible pages in the back. I lost count. I used to know what it was. I'm pretty sure it's close to, like, 25 or 30 pages of blank Bible paper in the back. But here's some acknowledgments. You can pause this and read this as well. So it gives some of the acknowledgments of the men who played a big role in this. Um, really, the big players were... Um, the ones listed at the front, Michael Barrett, Gerald Bike, uh, Bl uh, Bilks, excuse me, um, Paul Smalley, and Joel Beakey. And then they list like the Trinitarian Bible Society, some other people that had done some work on this as well. So trying to give credit where it is due, so I appreciate that. And then, yeah, like I said, you have a ton and ton and ton of blank paper back here. I'm not going to flip through every page because <laughs> it would be kind of monotonous, but there's a good... Good amount to take notes, whatever you want to do with that. Then you have maps. And again, so this is what I was saying. Since uh, this is Grand Rapids, Michigan, Zondervan's very big out there. So the maps are from Zondervan. Although, ironically, if you read the introduction to the study Bible, what I love a lot. Let me see here. Is this it's World of the Patriarchs? I think they have a route of the Exodus. Yeah. So you see they don't have a Red Sea crossing here. <laughs> Joel Beakey actually calls this out in his introduction to the study Bible and pretty much tells you it's wrong. Actually, I think it's the note in Exodus 19 i think that's right in exodus 19 there's a note which calls out this map in the back and pretty much says the map from zondervan's wrong and kind of gives you a better idea of where they actually crossed the red sea so besides that uh kind of one bummer on the maps the maps are actually really nice they're a semi-gloss paper they're thick kind of like a not a full card stock but kind of a semi-card stock and so you can kind of see the color and everything there and there's quite a bit of them so, some pretty good stuff and information in the back. And then that's pretty much it. So, this is uh, this has been the full review here for you of the Reformation Heritage Study Bible, King James Study Bible, I should say. They don't produce this in any other translation. Now, if, uh, if you are somebody who uses another translation and you wanted just the family worship section, if you're interested in that, you said, you know, you're saying, I wish I could do family worship. I want to do that. I don't know where to begin. Uh, Joel Beakey did publish a book, even though he is pro King James and TR. He did publish a book with just the uh, questions in a family worship book. Um, so you can look that up on their website. And then that way, if you read a different translation, you can still have access to the family worship questions, which I still think would be worth your time for sure. So again, that's a kind of a general uh, in-depth, could probably go more in-depth if there's something more that you want to see on the Reformation Heritage King James Study Bible, produced by Reformation Heritage Books. So I hope you guys have found this useful. If you have, please press the like button and subscribe if you're not already. And I hope to see you guys next time in the next video real soon. Take care and God bless.